Hello everyone and welcome to Uz Report World News Broadcasting with the latest news from Uzbekistan and around the world. President Shevkat Mirziyoyev during his regular meeting on Monday pointed out to the ineffectiveness of preschool education system. Even though the number of kindergartens has expanded from 5,200 to 18,300 over the past four years and the preschool education coverage has doubled to 60 percent, these figures remain not enough. Mirzi Yaev urged to organize 2,000 family kindergartens for 34,000 places in 53 districts. A proposal was approved to allow such kindergartens to hire additional employees and accept twice as many children. The government is to allocate 2.8 million US dollars to provide family kindergartens with free textbooks and methodological materials. In addition, these institutions would be provided with preferential loans in the amount of up to 3 million US dollars at a rate of 5% per annum to buy new equipment. Moreover, according to available legislation, kindergartens based on public-private partnerships receive subsidies to cover 50% of the cost per child. Mirziyoyev has instructed to increase this number to 75%, as well as to compensate 50% of the expenses of private kindergartens for electricity and natural gas. Some 50 preschool educational institutions are said to be established in remote settlements of 23 districts by 2023. The President of Uzbekistan congratulated all the school leavers of the country upon the graduation ceremony. There are about 438,000 of them this year. Shevkat Mirziyoyev noted that this period of time was exciting not only for children who have received their cherished certificates, but also for parents, teachers and mentors. Over the past four years, 134 new schools have been built. Almost 3,000 schools have been reconstructed and equipped in Uzbekistan. Absolutely new modern presidential and specialized schools have been opened. According to Mirziyoyev, over the past year and a half, Uzbek students have won four gold, 18 silver and 30 bronze medals at international Olympiads. Today, almost all schools across the country are connected to the broadband internet. Some 133 digital technology training centers have been launched. Based on the needs of the spheres and the sectors of the economy, over the past five years, 134 bachelor's degree and 147 master's degree courses have been opened. Currently, Uzbek applicants have the opportunity to pass the entrance exams to five higher educational institutions at once. The new Uzbekistan University, which is being built in the capital in cooperation with the most advanced universities in the world, is soon to open its doors. Uzbekistan's Ministry of Health and French multinational pharmaceutical company Sanofi have agreed to strengthen the disease management in the Central Asian countries. A corresponding memorandum of cooperation was signed by Deputy Health Minister of Uzbekistan Abdul Azizov and Belarus Division of Sanofi Vitaly Bistrukov. Some of the major concerns highlighted in the provisions aim at ensuring the implementation of diabetes management as well as the improvement of the national immunization programs. It also aims at conducting awareness raising activities to raise professional awareness on diabetes and vaccines. During the pandemic, the concern over disease management has become increasingly pressing for the entire global community. This is because the high mortality rate within COVID-19 infected population is affected by chronic non-infectious diseases that can cause severe complications. We believe that cooperation between the state, business and society is necessary to achieve high-quality health indicators. The signed memorandum testifies to our intention to provide the population with access to innovations in the field of health care, as well as to realize the country's social and economic potential and improve the investment climate, Abdullah Azizov said. Turkey has taken the first place in the number of new companies registered in Uzbekistan, according to the country's statistical committee. There were 846 companies with foreign capital in the country in January April. Some 164 of them were established with the capital of Turkey. Russia had 119 entities. China had 94. Back in 2019, Turkish entrepreneurs said that projects in Uzbekistan are of great importance to them, as the economy of Turkey itself has been experiencing difficulties in recent years due to the economic crisis. Turkish businesses are trying to compensate this circumstance by entering international markets. Samarkand region of Uzbekistan eyes to become a transport and tourist hub. The international airport Air Marakanda, which is currently being erected, is to help achieve this goal. The project is financed at the expense of 80 million US dollars worth of private investment of Air Marakanda, with the involvement of specialists from Munich and Istanbul International Airports. 
Russia's biggest car manufacturer, Gas Group, has announced its intention to launch production of light and medium commercial vehicles in Uzbekistan. A corresponding agreement was signed with the Tashkent City Administration within the framework of International Industrial Exhibition in Naprom. The company plans to produce cars for housing, communal, social and medical services, as well as urban transportation. An official press release quotes that Uzbekistan is traditionally one of the key markets of gas, with service centers and a spare parts warehouse which will provide after-sales support. The Gorky Automobile plant of Gas Group is the largest manufacturer of trucks and specialized vehicles in Russia. It was founded in 1932 when the first truck, one and a half tonner, Gas AA, rolled off its line. Since the moment of its establishment, it has produced over 18 million vehicles. Today, Gas produces light and medium duty commercial vehicles, buses, powertrains, engines, and over 500 types of special vehicles. Uzbekistan is intending to launch a new stage of mandatory labeling of goods. The procedure to be effective from June this year would apply to medicines, beverages and household appliances. Besides, pilot projects are set to affect 15 local companies. According to the government decree, the mass labeling process is scheduled for 2022. The size of a single payment for the provision of per code is 6 US dollars, excluding VAT. But participants of pilot projects would receive them free of charge. The introduction of the labeling system is beneficial for both the state and consumers and manufacturers. Manufacturers would receive an effective mechanism for combating counterfeit products, be able to improve the efficiency of business processes, would see the process of delivery of products to the end consumer in real time, and also plan the production of their products based on their sales. Consumers would be able to receive detailed information about the goods they have bought, make sure that the goods they have bought are legal and would not harm their health. Residents of Samarkand on Monday witnessed an unusual incident on the ancient city roads. People have decided to push the tram a few meters in order to keep themselves in a good shape, according to information provided by some social media. Later on, the city administration responded to a video and said that the tram was forced to stop at an intersection due to a short-term power outage. The passengers helped to move it from the intersection to prevent a traffic jam. The power supply was restored within the next two hours. The United States has reached a new milestone in the fight against the coronavirus, reporting last week the lowest number of new COVID-19 cases in nearly a year, according to a Reuters analysis of state and local data. New infections dropped 26% from the previous seven days to just under 180,000 for the week. New cases have fallen for six weeks in a row and hit their lowest level since the week ending June 14, 2020. Deaths from COVID-19 fell 5% to just under 4,000 in the week ending May 23rd, the fewest deaths in a week since March 2020. 39.6% of the country's population has been fully vaccinated, and nearly 50% has received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Vermont leads the country with 69% of its residents receiving at least one dose, followed by Massachusetts at 65%. The rate of vaccinations, however, has been slowing for five straight weeks. In the past seven days, an average of 1.8 million vaccine doses were administered per day, down from a peak of 3.1 million shots per day in April. The Reuters analysis comes as many Americans begin to return to some semblance of normalcy, with local governments and businesses beginning to lift mask and social distancing requirements after the Centers for Disease Control said fully vaccinated Americans can go maskless in most settings. Belarus has sparked international outrage by forcing a Ryanair plane to divert to Minsk before arresting an opposition journalist on board. Belarus grounded the Ryanair passenger plane flying over its airspace on Sunday for what turned out to be false claims of a bomb on board. Although the flight was on its way to Lithuania from Greece, Belarusian authorities ordered a military fighter jet to escort it to the capital city of Minsk. According to local media, Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko had personally deployed the warplane. No explosives were found on board the jet. Instead, when it reached the ground, authorities detained one of the passengers, Belarusian journalist Roman Protasevich. 26-year-old Protasevich worked for online news service Nexta last year when it broadcast mass protests against Lukashenko. 
He's now wanted on extremism charges and is accused of inciting riots, allegations he denies. A passenger on board the aircraft said Protasevich had his head in his hands and was shaking when he realized the flight was diverted to Minsk. Later, as he was led away, he reportedly remarked, I'll get the death penalty here. When it was announced that uh, we're going to Langton Minsk, so the Romans stand up, we really opened the, uh, let's say, luggage uh, door, take the luggage, and was trying to split the things, like computer, give it to a girlfriend, iPhone or whatever it's called, phone. After seven hours in Minsk, the flight retook its course and landed in Vilnius, Lithuania. Lithuania's president, Gatanis Nauseda, said Belarus must face consequences. It should be noted that such attacks on the opposition have recently become systematic. I'm attending the European Council tomorrow, and we will no doubt raise this issue as well. It's time to stop communicating with the regime just by making declarations. Concrete measures are needed, capable of changing the behavior of the Belarusian regime. Global leaders followed suit in their condemnation, including U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and head of EU's European Commission Ursula von der Leyen, who tweeted, quote, Those responsible for the Ryanair hijacking must be sanctioned. Human rights groups say about 35,000 people have been detained in Belarus since August, and more than 1,000 criminal cases have been launched. Lockdowns cast a chill over Germany's economy in the first quarter. New numbers out Tuesday show GDP shrank by 1.8% on the previous three months and 3.1% on the year. Both figures were worse than economists expected. The drop came as consumers hoarded their cash. Household spending dropped by 5.4% on the quarter, while the savings rate rose to a record level. One economist described the slump in spending as colossal. And it came even as the government ploughed billions of euros into job protection schemes and cash handouts, such as extra child benefits. Companies also invested less in machinery and equipment over the period. But there were some bright spots in the data too. Construction activity rose, and so did exports. Overseas shipments increased 1.8% on the quarter, helped by strong demand from the US and China. Even so, the latest growth numbers compare badly with the rest of the Eurozone, which saw a far smaller contraction. But economists say progress on lifting lockdowns and tackling the health crisis should see healthier numbers for Germany over the coming months. Military officers in Mali detained the interim president, prime minister and defense minister on Monday. That's what multiple sources told Reuters just months after the country's former leader was ousted in a coup. Sources said President Baanda, Prime Minister Mokhtar Oan and Defense Minister Suleiman Dekor were all taken to a military base in Kati outside the capital, Bamako. That came just hours after two members of the military lost their positions in a government reshuffle. The military's ultimate goal was not immediately clear. One official in Kati said this was not an arrest. Their detentions could exacerbate instability in the West African country, where violent Islamist groups linked to al-Qaeda and the Islamic State control large areas in the desert north. The United Nations mission in Mali called for the group's immediate and unconditional release and said those who hold the leaders would have to answer for their actions. The region's top decision-making body, ECOWAS, said a delegation will visit Bamako on Tuesday to help resolve the, quote, attempted coup. Kati's military base is notorious for ousting Mali's leaders. Last August, the military took President Ibrahim Boubacar Keita to the town of Kati and forced him to resign. New York City's school system, the largest in the country, will offer no remote learning option in the fall, requiring all of its 1.1 million students to attend classes in person. The move is a major step toward normalcy for what was once the epicenter of the pandemic. It's time for everyone to come back. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio made the announcement Monday. Every single child will be back in the classroom. I have talked to so many parents who have been wanting to hear this confirmed, and I am confirming it once and for all. We're going to have plenty of protections in place. 
That includes face masks, which will still be required for students. But what about social distancing in the classroom? The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention requires students to be three feet apart. But de Blasio says he expects those rules to change before the start of the next school year. We have seen the CDC moving constantly with the data. So again, it is, you know, May 24th, first day of school, September 13th. Uh, I think the fact is clear to me that as more data comes in, more progress, they're going to make adjustments. In the current school year, the system has offered a hybrid weekly schedule in which students attend classes in person some days, remote on others. Some parents also opted to keep their children home for remote learning altogether. Those options will not be offered in September. The decision to open schools fully come as positivity rates for COVID-19 in New York and the country have settled into a sustained decline as more people become vaccinated, with new cases also dropping. New York City is not alone in declaring a full reopening. Governor Phil Murphy in neighboring New Jersey declared that his state's schools would no longer offer a remote learning option in September following similar moves by other states. A consortium led by Kenyan telecoms operator Safaricom aims to start operations in Ethiopia next year, it said on Monday. That's after it won a license to operate in what is one of the world's last closed-off telecommunications markets. The consortium, which also includes South Africa's Vodacom and the UK's Vodafone, bid 850 million US dollars, Ethiopian government officials said on Saturday. On Monday, the consortium said it would aim to start providing telecommunication services from 2022. Shares in Safaricom surged almost 7% on the news. In addition to the license fee, the consortium plans to invest $8.5 billion in infrastructure. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed described that as the single largest foreign direct investment into Ethiopia to date. Ethiopia's communications agency said bidding would soon open for a second license. And the Ethiopian government is also preparing to sell a 45% stake in state-run mobile operator Ethio Telecom. Africa's second most populous country hopes that opening up the telecoms market will create millions of online job opportunities. Abu Shams is a dentist to Syria's displaced. Displaced himself, he now tours the camps of Idlib, implanting teeth or dentures to those in need. For Syrians who are struggling financially, he's a lifesaver, charging around half the price of a professional clinic, $100 for dentures and between 5 to $10 for a tooth implant. The dental technician explains how he learned his trade. I've been fixing teeth for 20 years. We were handed this career through heritage, not by studying, and we were able to improve it over time. Our ancestors first used to work with golden teeth. We've improved things so we're able to make whole dentures. Thank God our work is very good. He used to implant metal, copper or gold teeth, but has now moved on to using porcelain as technology improves. China's Huawei announced it will launch its own operating system for smartphones next week, according to an internal memo seen by Reuters. It's the company's biggest move to deal with U.S. sanctions from 2019, which banned Huawei from access to U.S.-born technology. That included Google's mobile services and Android applications, which were vital to Huawei phones. The soon-to-be-launched Harmony OS will be the first move into business areas that can't be affected by sanctions. It's not clear if the launch will include new smartphones. Huawei was at once the world's largest smartphone maker, but now ranks sixth globally. Harmony OS will only mitigate some of the impact of U.S. sanctions, which also impeded its ability to design its own chips and source from outside vendors. In the internal memo, Huawei encouraged a more open-source approach to development and said it will look to overseas software experts as part of the pivot.
Investors flocked to tech stocks Wednesday, driving Wall Street higher. Cooling inflation fears dragged down Treasury yields, and that fueled the rally in rate-sensitive growth stocks like Apple and Microsoft. The Dow finished a half percent higher, the S&P 500 gained 1 percent, and the Nasdaq jumped 1.4 percent. But Kramer Capital Research Chief Investment Officer Hillary Kramer says it's too soon to put inflation worries to bed. Now the demand is so great that companies cannot fulfill the orders, smaller businesses are not getting access like they need, and we're going to see a spiraling of inflation, and we're going to see wage inflation very, very soon. Risk sentiment also improved as cryptocurrencies recovered some losses after further signs of a Chinese crackdown on the sector fueled a sell-off. Shares of miners' Riot blockchain rose 14 percent and Marathon Digital 11 percent. Virgin Galactic's shares skyrocketed 28 percent. British billionaire Sir Richard Branson's spaceship company completed its first manned spaceflight over the weekend. These were the top headlines for today. Stay safe and goodbye.